Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Epstein. I'm the marketing specialist here at Perks. Welcome to our webinar. Our presenter today is Mr. Lee Slayton. He's the Vice President of Healthcare with Smart Training. And Smart Training has been a Perks exclusive OSHA and HIPAA compliance partner for over eight years now. Uh, in those uh, in the past eight years, Smart Training um, compliance advisors have completed over 1,500 inspections of dental practices all over the U.S. Smart Training has assisted over 15,000 dental professionals across the country with their compliance needs. Mr. Slayton will provide us with an update on COVID-19 and how it's affecting dental practices. Smart Training's compliance advisors are inspecting dental practices across the country every week. Mr. Slayton will let you know what advisors are seeing and how that can apply to your practice as well. I'd like to mention that TDA Perks offers several other endorsed vendors and they're available to help assist you in your practice from compliance to dental supplies, to marketing and financial resources. I urge you to take advantage of the resource section in our website, tdaperks.com. We have several articles uh, for you to take a look at. We also have all of our archived webinars uh, that we do every month. Uh, you can get in touch with me, um, Josh Epstein again, that's jepstein at tda.org or you can reach out to me by phone, happy to help, 512-443-3675, extension 161. Uh, with that said, Lee, ready to go? Okay, Josh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And Josh is getting his licks in today, and I just gotta say to start with, I may be old, but I ain't dead. Uh, this is the first time Josh has started calling me Mr. And I guess maybe it's because I turned 66 yesterday, but I've, 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 I've still got a little life in me. So, um, so as, uh, as, as one of the Cuomo brothers says, let's, let's get at it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, huh? No, nothing. I'm sorry, Lee. I was just laughing at your, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lee. <laughs> uh, want to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're seeing out there in, in the dental space um, and what we anticipate uh, in the next few months um, to kind of keep you all abreast of, of what's happening. Um, I know uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, practice owners, um, their, their focus, as it should be, is on, on good patient outcomes, so they're not necessarily way up to speed on what's happening outside their workplace that can affect them sometimes in, in very, very uh, harsh ways. So that's what we want to talk about today. So first of all, let's talk about what's the same. And we're going we're gonna to talk about three basic things, the TSBDE rule, CDC recommendations, and OSHA recommendations. And, and it's all a, it's all a, uh, it's like a, it's like a hairball um, because there are overlapping rules and recommendations and so what we're going to try and do is, is we're going to try and sort some of those out for you today, among other things. OK, so. What's changed? Well, the, the TSBDE rule um, was extended to February 20th. Um, we fully expect that to be extended again. But the practical reality for you as a dental practitioner uh, doesn't change. Uh, because if if really the only difference that makes is if 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 the TSBD doesn't extend that rule, then that means if you were cited for something, it might not affect your license, but it can still affect your pocketbook. So, um, but we'll be looking, you know, as as uh, as we roll into February to see uh, how they're going to address that. But I fully expect it. You know, with the, with the rate of transmission, um, um, I, I fully expect them to extend that again. But we'll keep you posted on that. So let's let's just talk for just a minute about what the TSBDE rule says, um, and in particular, uh, it talks about respirator use. Um, it says that um, you know you've got to implement transmission-based precautions, which include N95 and KN95 respirators, or their substantial equivalent. Um, for all dental health care professionals, likely uh, or within six feet of any um, uh, procedures likely to involve aerosols. Um, so that's the, that's the TSBDE rule. 
and it follows pretty closely on CDC recommendations and OSHA recommendations, but that's the actual rule. So, so we were talking about what's the same. Okay, let's talk about what's changed. Um, one thing that has changed is the CDC's recommendations, and these changed back in early December. Uh, and what they did is um, they kind of delineated their recommendations by the rate of community transmission. So if you were in a community that had a low to no rate of community transmission, then um, uh, unless you were dealing with someone that was suspected of having COVID, you didn't have to worry about wearing um, respirators, okay? Uh, that that was that was the big uh, that was the big point. The, the the unfortunate thing right now is that practically the whole country uh, is is or is made up of communities that have moderate to high rates of community transmission. Um, you're going to see in just a second why this particular CDC recommendation really doesn't have much impact on your practice. So um, the OSHA recommendations right now, uh, and they are recommendations as far as respirator use in dental practices. They're recommendations, not, uh, it's not a rule. Um, but what we're probably gonna see shortly is we're gonna expect to see them to change that from a recommendation to an emergency temporary rule. Now, um, you know, OSHA is, is run by several different entities. Uh, there's federal OSHA, which um, uh, covers all the states that don't have their own state plans, but there are 22 states that have their own OSHA plan. And just to give you a, a, for, a for instance, in Oregon, uh, they have a slew of extra um, rules um, pertaining to COVID for all businesses, uh, dental practices included. Um, so we're going to see on the federal level pretty soon, I think, based on what uh, what some folks higher up the food chain in OSHA have told me, we're going to we're going to see that go from a recommendation to an emergency temporary rule. Now, what what are the practical implications of that? Well, <clears throat> the practical in, impl implications really it's not going to change much because. Um, you know, let's step back for a second and remember why we have OSHA and what they do. Um, OSHA, and this is going to sound crass, but it's the truth. OSHA could give a rip whether you kill every patient that sits in your chair. They, they don't care about that. That's the TDA, TSBDE's bailiwick. What OSHA cares about is that your employees are coming to a safe workplace and they're going home safely at the end of the day. And you as a practice owner, if you're a corporation uh, and you're a W-2 employee, you're also an employee. So they're worried about you as well. So what, what OSHA has, they've got recommendations on, on about respirators for dental practices right now, but they've also got an overarching rule. Um, and it's, it's that every employee, it's called the general duty clause. And that's kind of their gotcha. Uh, if you want to look at this in an adversarial way, that's their gotcha. Uh, if they find something that is serious enough that they need to bring it to your attention uh, and they can't, they can't do it any other way. The general duty clause basically says that every employer uh, has the obligation to provide a workplace uh, safe um, for their employees to work in um, and, you know, to, to get rid of the hazards uh, to their employees' health and well-being. So uh, these recommendations, OSHA recommendations about respirators right now, which are basically like this, they don't delineate on um, where uh, from a geographical location standpoint and the rate of community transmission, they don't delineate in that. All they delineate in is treating patients that are uh, not suspected, or well patients in other words, 
or patients that are suspected or have COVID. And the way they've got it broken down is for well patients, uh, if it's um, uh, procedures that are not considered aerosol generating, um, then a mask and a face shield is fine. Uh, if they are uh, aerosol generating procedures, then they're recommending um, that uh, any dental health care professional that's, that's within six feet of them, that they're wearing a respirator. Um, and on the federal level and on the Texas level, uh, when we're talking about respirators, um, it can be an N95 or a KN95. Now, in some places, that's not the case. Uh, Oregon's a good, for instance, they will not allow KN95s to be used out there. Um, but uh, the feds do, um, and the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners does. So, um, but we expect that we expect that recommendation to change to an emergency temporary rule. But for all practical purposes, for you as a practice owner, um, that does not change. Um, so, just um, un until we're past this thing, um, we're gonna we're gonna be living with respirators. Okay, what else has changed? Um, about two years ago, um, Congress um, changed how they do uh, penalties for OSHA enforcement. Uh, and they set it on an automatic scale. Uh, it, inc it increases uh, by the, I believe it's the rate of inflation, uh, and it's automatic each year. It, it could actually go up or down. Uh, they got to a point where it was four or five years between changes. And so, um, you know, penalties could go up uh, pretty tremendously. So they, they put it on an automatic schedule so that um, so that it changes. If it, it can change once a year, and that's on January 1st. This year it changed. Uh, it went up now for a first time penalty. Now is a, a maximum of $13,653 per violation. And that's for serious violations, other than serious, and posting requirements, or what we call de minimis um, violations. So up to 13.6 for a single violation. Um, what's also changed is their failure to abate penalty. Uh, that's gone up to $13,600 per day uh, beyond the abatement. So what that means is, uh, if OSHA comes in and cites you uh, for a violation and um, you've got a certain amount of time to abate that hazard, uh, and if you don't have it abated in that allotted time, they're going to they're gonna come back and check. Uh, and if you have not abated it yet, they can, they can penal uh, penalize you over $13,000 a day for every day beyond that abatement period. So um, if you do get on the wrong end of a um, meeting with OSHA, uh, for goodness sakes, uh, make sure that whatever uh, deficiencies were identified, that you get them fixed in that abatement period because it gets really ugly if you don't. Okay, and here's the big daddy, the penalty for willful or repeated violations. That's gone up to $136,000 per violation. And I have seen that used. I haven't seen it used in a dental practice yet, but there are several industries where I've seen it top out at 100, well, uh, last year was 120 some odd thousand. I've seen it top out at 120 some odd thousand. So um, anyway, it's not something you ever, wanna, you ever wanna have to fool with. So just be aware. Um, and let's let's talk about what 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 would constitute a willful violation. Um, let's say, um, and, and and this would also fall under repeated. Let let's say um, OSHA came in and inspected your dental practice, and let's say you didn't have a hazardous chemical inventory list, uh, and let's say you had a sharps container that were that was overflowing. Uh, both of those would be considered serious violations. Uh, the last um, the last violation I saw for lack of a hazardous chemical inventory list was about $4,000. Um, 
So let's say OSHA came in, cited you for that, and they came back six months later and reinspected you as they like to do for serious violations. If they came back um, and you didn't have that hazardous chemical inventory list updated, then they could hit you for a willful violation. And now the gloves really come off because now they're not limited to 13,000. Now they're limited by only by 136,000. So now are you gonna get $136,000 violation for not having a hazardous chemical inventory list? Probably not. Um, are, are you wanting to roll the dice on that? I, I sure as heck wouldn't. So just be aware. It, and what I kind of go back to when I look at these violations, I kind of look, look back and look at it from the sense of being a practice owner. Um, as a practice owner, you're a leader. And if you've got smart employees, they're gonna look at your actions and how you comport yourself. And they're going to think in their mind, hey, if it's, if it's important enough for the boss, it should be important enough for me. So if my boss is doing this, then I need to pay attention to that and I'm, I need to be doing it as well. Uh, it's kind of the same way with this. Um, you know, OSHA wants, to, OSHA wants everybody to say, stay safe, to have a safe workplace. That, that's their goal. That, you know, most, most of their inspectors are actually pretty nice folks. Um, the problem is uh, they see a lot of bad things happen. So uh, they really have a, they really want to serve and they don't, it just, it tears them up to see somebody do something stupid that they have seen in other instances really hurt someone badly. So you got you got to remember that's that's what they're carrying with them. They're carrying a little bit of baggage in that they've seen bad things happen to people uh, that they may see in your practice, and it kind of riles them up. So if it's important to them, it should be important to you. Okay, so let's talk about the most frequent violations we're seeing right now because we're out there in the marketplace. Uh, I know one of my compliance advisors is on here today. Um, you know, and he's he's going all over the country. Um, uh, let's 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 talk about what we're seeing out there right now. And let's also talk about the violations that are actually being cited um, for penalties right now, because uh, we we take a look at the OSHA database. Uh, I look at it every week to see what's happening out there, because uh, it's a really good gauge as to what complaints are coming in and how OSHA is responding to those complaints. So what are, the, what are the big three right now? Staff not wearing appropriate PPE, especially respirators. Staff not using respirators appropriately and lack of mandatory respiratory protection program. Are y'all seeing a trend here? <laughs> it's all about respirators. The, 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 you know, the virus that we're dealing with is spread by, you know, uh, aerosols. That, that's that's the biggest way it goes. And I don't know how many of you. Uh, I, I, I'm a I'm a news junkie. Uh, I read a lot because I grew up in the newspaper business. Um, you know these new variants of the of COVID. Uh, they're estimating that they they are uh, about 50 percent or more infectious than the original virus. So. And, and if you saw any, any of the articles where they were quoting CDC officials in the last week or two, they're saying, you know, if you were going into a grocery store before with a cloth mask and it was, and it was protecting you, uh, you probably need to um, hunker down and try and find respirators to wear if you're gonna be out and about a lot because the viral load uh, is much higher and, and much more virulent with these new variants. So anyway, um, so let's let's talk about these. So um, in talking about the things we see most frequently, let's let's uh, get into some of these um, uh, mis oops, sorry, some misconceptions. Um, 
uh, and and we're lucky in Texas that the TSBDE actually outlined this very specifically, I, and I'm assuming it's because they had a lot of calls from, from practice owners. A level three surgical mask with a face shield, used in conjunction with a face shield, is not the equivalent of an N95 or a KN95 respirator. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, uh, a respirator is a respirator. Uh, masks are not. Um, if you're, uh, if, if this is the mode you're using right now for um, uh, when you're within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure, you are, number one, you're rolling the dice as to whether you might end up catching something. But number two, um, uh, you're leaving yourself wide open to uh, disciplinary action from the TSBDE or a big fine from OSHA. Okay, that will not work. All right, why is this? Here we go. Um, and here's the other one. And there's a there's been a lot of uh, miscommunication about this. Um, as far as staff not wearing appro um, uh, appropriate PPE, uh, there are a lot of folks out there that are double masking. Uh, in other words, wearing a level three mask on top of a respirator um, with the with the thought process of I'm gonna I'm going to be able to conserve uh, my respirators, not have to replace them as often because I'll replace a level three mask um, every time um, I change patients or, or you know, uh, for whatever reason you would change that. Um, that is not a NIOSH approved um, scenario. Uh, and when I say it's not NIOSH approved, you go, okay, well, what, what does that really mean? Well, here's what it means. Um, OSHA does not have a regulation for every single thing. If they don't have a regulation about a particular item, then many times they will refer to a regulatory body that does. So for instance, they sometimes will refer to CDC recommendations. Sometimes they will refer to NIOSH recommendations. So NIOSH is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Um, uh, they come into play a lot with uh, respiratory problems. So uh, NIOSH um, uh, sets, the, sets the standards as far as air sampling uh, for excess levels of nitrous oxide, for instance. Um, those are NIOSH numbers that are published. So um, so I guess the bottom line to that, the fact that it's not NIOSH approved means that if OSHA were to come in uh, and to see you doing that, uh, they could use the fact it's not NIOSH approved to um, correct that deficiency would be a nice way of putting it. That means you might get a fine, you might not, but I guarantee you they would bring it up because it's not an approved um, uh, way of conserving uh, your respirators. What is approved is wearing a face shield with a respirator, but not double masking. Um, and and another to, to another point on this, um, you know, the reason you have to have a respiratory protection program is because respirators are harder to breathe through. You're actually breathing through that filtering medium. medium not around the edges of a surgical mask. So um, adding a mask on top of a respirator makes it that much harder to breathe. Um, so that's, that's another reason why it's not approved. Uh, you're just making it that much more difficult for your staff if you're double masking, okay? So, um, so let's let's talk about conserving PPE. It's it's been a big deal. Uh, what I'm hearing out in the field now is that is easing somewhat. Uh, it's it's becoming easier to get N N95s. It's certainly getting easier to to um, acquire KN95s. Um, the prices are coming down some. Uh, if you're in a position where you still need to conserve N95s or KN95s, 
Um, there's, there's an approved way to do that uh, without double masking. Um, and it's limited reuse. And so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that for a minute. Now I'm 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 gonna throw out a word of caution here to you. Um, if you're in an area where you can get an adequate supply of respirators, where you're not having to constantly reuse them, you need to be aware of this. Number one, it's not as safe to keep reusing them because of cross-contamination issues. Uh, so if you're in a position where you can uh, use them just like you've used masks before, where you replace them with each patient, you should do so. Um, you know, the prices are not outrageous now like they were before. Um, but if you're reusing them and you're in an area where uh, you can acquire enough to be um, disposing of them after each patient. You need to be aware of this. Were OSHA to come in uh, and inspect your office and uh, they see that you're reusing masks, they're probably going to inquire about that. And they're going to want to know, have you made a good faith effort to get the masks that you need to where you can change them after each patient? Uh, they want to know that you've made a good faith effort, and they're probably going to want to see some documentation. Um, you know, if you say, "Yeah, we've 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 been trying to get them, but we just can't we just can't get them," and uh, and OSHA picks up the phone and calls a couple of your suppliers, and they go, "Oh yeah, we've got them. You know, we're limit we're limiting our our clients to you know 75 percent of what they could order before." Uh, you're probably going to get cited. So just just be aware. Um, if you're still in a position where they're hard to source, uh, this is this is a this is an approved way uh, to help conserve them. But if if you can get an adequate supply, I would go back to changing those after each patient, just like you do with your masks, um, because again, uh, cross contamination issues, and um, you know this is a much more um, virulent virus now that we're dealing with. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, approved way um, to get more use out of your uh, respirators. So here's kind of the way it works. And I know some of you out here out in Texas are already, have already been doing this, uh, but for some people it's new news. Uh, or for those who might be double masking right now, uh, and gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's not the best scenario in the world. Here, here's a workaround for you that is approved. Uh, so here's the way it works. If you're open five days a week, you're gonna, for starters, you're gonna get enough respirators for each respirator user to have one for each working day of the week. Okay, so uh, so let's start out on Monday. On Monday, I go in, I put my respirator on, I keep it, I use it for that entire day. At the end of the day, I'm gonna doff that respirator and I'm gonna put it in a paper sack. I'm going to write my name on it. I'm going to write the day of the week on it. I'm going to store it off in a safe place. And I'm not going to touch that again until the following Monday. That gives us six days before we touch that respirator again for the virus on it that might be on it to die. Uh, and you'll do that for each day, each day of the week that you work. So you're, you're just you're going to have a rotation. Uh, and when the next Monday rolls around, you're going to repeat the process, and uh, and that's that's an approved that's an approved method. Now, um, unless specified otherwise in your IFUs, that we love acronyms, um, you can use those respirators up to five times before they must be discarded. Now, if if the straps are breaking or getting frayed or you know, the, the respirator is showing wear, um, um, you would want to replace it before then. But if that's not the case, and if the manufacturer doesn't say something different, like if a manufacturer came out and said, you can only use this three times before you have to replace it, or if a manufacturer came out and said, you can use this up to seven times before you have to replace it, 
you can go with the manufacturer's IFU. Uh, but if not, um, you can use it up to five times before it's discarded. Okay, so the last one we're going to, the last of the most frequent violations we're seeing right now, we're going to talk about the mandatory respiratory protection program. So um, I wish I could see a show of hands, but I can't. Um, most, 99% of all dental practices before COVID um, had to have three written safety programs. Uh, or what a lot of people refer to as their OSHA map. So you had an exposure control plan, you had a hazard communication program, and you had an emergency action plan. Those are the only three we've ever had since time immemorial in, in, in the dental space. Now, lo and behold, we've got a fourth. Uh, you have to have a respiratory protection plan. It's mandatory that you have one if you have anyone in your, in, in your office that wears a respirator. Um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Um, we, I, I know of at least one uh, single location dental practice that, that got fined over $24,000 for not having one in place. Um, and now that OSHA is starting to come back out into the field, you know, a lot, of, a lot of their inspectors, well, they've all been working from home pretty much. Um, the investigations that we've dealt with since COVID uh, have all been handled through uh, mail correspondence and phone calls. Um, and that has not slacked off. Actually, the number of complaints has gone up um, because um, a lot of employees, um, they're on edge about coming into work because they know that OSHA classifies dental practices as, as high risk places of work right now. So um, we expect to see more of these violations issued in the next couple of months, uh, unless, unless this thing magically goes away. But we've heard that before and it hadn't happened. And I, I'm not led to believe it's going to soon. Um, so, uh, you know, OSHA basically gave the dental industry a grace period. Uh, because we went from no dental practices in the U.S. needing a mandatory RPP to a situation where overnight um, practically all dental practices had to have an RPP in place. So they kind of cut us some slack, um, but it's kind of hard for someone to plead ignorance now to that requirement. Um, I've given probably 15 webinars on this uh, since March, um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty well known. No, it, it, someone would have a really, really hard time pleading ignorance today to that requirement. And even if you did plead ignorance, uh, they would wonder what planet you're from. So who's required to have an RPP? And it's pretty simple. Any entity that has employees who are either required to wear a respirator or who choose to wear a respirator voluntarily. Uh, in OSHA's eyes, the bottom line, in OSHA's eyes, if they come into your office uh, and you have staff that are within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure and they're not wearing respirators, they're gonna, they're gonna find you. Uh, that's, that's just the, that's the reality because everyone should be wearing one that's within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure. Um, there's, there, there's plenty of science back to back that up. So now, so you've got folks that are required to wear them in your practice. So what if you're, what if the person working at your front desk comes up and says, hey, Dr. Smith, you know, with my diabetes, I, I'm kind of at high risk. I'd, I'd really like to wear a respirator, even though I'm not required to wear one. Can, can they wear one? Absolutely, no question. Um, and you would be responsible for providing one for them. Um, so they don't have to, but anyone that wants to wear one can, uh, and you're required to provide one for them. Now, 
Um, without getting too deep into the RPP, a um, um, couple of things real quick uh, that we have questions about. So I'm going to go ahead and nip a couple of these in the in the bud. Um, if you're familiar with them, there are medical evaluations that are required for respirator users. And for some respirator users, there are fit tests required. So why does, why does one person get one thing and one person doesn't? Well, that's a pretty good question. And it's simply this. If someone is wearing a respirator voluntarily, in other words, they don't have to for the, to, to effectively do their job. If they're just wearing one to be safe, they have to complete a medical evaluation. And that's a very simple process. Um, now, if you're required to wear a respirator, then you got to do that medical evaluation, but you also have to do a fit test to ensure that that respirator is working as it's designed to function. So that's 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 the dividing point. If you're wearing one just because you want to, uh, you do have to do a medical evaluation, but you don't have to do a fit test. If you're required to wear one, you've got to do a medical evaluation and you have to be fit tested. Now, I'll go ahead and answer another question that comes up a lot for right now. Um, a lot of folks say, well, no, wait a minute, fit tests, they've been rescinded. You don't have to do those right now during the pandemic. That is absolutely false. Um, what OSHA has done is they have temporarily rescinded the requirement for an annual fit test. So let me give you an example. Everyone has to do an initial fit test. So if you were on the ball and you got your respiratory protection program in place back in March, um, and you had all your folks fit tested in March and did their medical evaluations in March, then if we weren't in the middle of the pandemic, come this March, another, what, 30 days or so from now, you would have to do fit tests again for your employees who are required to wear respirators. Well, that requirement has been temporarily rescinded. So you don't have to go back and do it again, but you do have to do the initial fit test. And, th and that's where the confusion came in. A lot of folks, you know, a lot of misinformation out there. Folks are saying, oh, no, you don't have to do the fit test. That is incorrect. You have to do that first one. They have rescinded the annual requirement thereafter. And I suspect, well, I'm, I'm not going to prognosticate on that because I haven't gotten any kind of good feel from any of my folks up the food chain at OSHA. Um, but but that's that's how that works. Okay, we've got time for questions. I've tried hey, to run through this. Go yeah, ahead, Josh, you. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, Lee. So uh, I appreciate your, the information, Lee. It looks like we have a couple questions down below. Uh, one, you know, from Dr. McCauley, who, you know, is, is just mentioning that the N95s are harder to find with the public, you know, purchasing so many of them and the price is moving higher. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, that's a great question, and um, the um, I, what I would do is I would go for a, a KN95. Um, typically, they're less expensive, and typically they're they have more in stock. Um, and from where I'm sitting, um, uh, the ones I've seen, uh, and and this is anecdotal, just be transparent about that. Anecdotal. Uh, they work just as well now, and and you know the 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 feds have given that emergency use authorization for KN95s. So if you can't get N95s, or if the price on N95s are just outrageous, uh, I would go with a KN95, and they should be able to source those. I you know I, I know without calling names. Uh, I know several um, uh, dental suppliers uh, that have a pretty fair uh, inventory on hand of KN95s. So um, anyway, um, yeah, I, I know I know TDA Perk Supplies um, does have 
N95s, NKN95s as well. So uh, this is an endorsed Perks vendor there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, here's here's one. Here's a good question. What 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 all is involved with having an RPP, a respiratory protection program? Um, there are several um, parts and pieces. Uh, number one, you, you have to have someone who's designated as the administrator um, so that if they come in, um, you've got to have someone designated so y'all can't point fingers at each other when they ask who's in charge. Someone has to be ultimately responsible for it. Um, there has to be a written program that outlines how you're going to go about using those respirators, you're donning and doffing, and record keeping is a big piece of that. They're going to want to know when you completed those medical evaluations, when you completed those fit tests. Um, the medical evaluations are, are really simple. Um, the, um, there, there's a uh, medical questionnaire uh, that's an appendix in, in OSHA um, uh, as part of the OSHA regs. It's, a, it's a, about a, I don't know, 40 or 50 question questionnaire. Um, a potential respirator user will fill that out, and then that is going to be evaluated by a licensed healthcare professional. And we've received the opinion uh, from at least two different state uh, dental boards that um, uh, a dentist, uh, it's within the dentist's scope of practice to be able to evaluate a medical questionnaire and determine whether or not that potential respirator user is safe to wear a respirator. Um, so what, what we recommend is that uh, if, if the dental practice hasn't done it yet, they will have their dentist review those medical questionnaires. And if they don't see a problem, then they merely sign off that they approve it and they date it and they take that medical questionnaire and what do they do with it? They put it in that patient or in that employee's confidential medical file. Because remember, is, is that piece of paper PHI? Absolutely. So it goes in that confidential medical file. Now, if, if a practice owner looks over that medical questionnaire, sees some things that concern them, talk to that employee about those concerns, and they still have that little funny feeling in the pit of their stomach, then our advice to them is to refer that employee out to um, an occupational health clinic uh, so that some so that a licensed healthcare professional that deals with um, respiratory respirator users on a daily basis review that uh, as as a little bit more oversight on it. Okay. Um, so so that's the medical evaluation. And then the fit test. Um, I have a question here about well, how do you get a fit test? Where do you get a fit test? There are a couple of ways you can go about doing that. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I've got one. Uh, what if the person fails the medical evaluation? Okay, that's a great question. Um, if they fail the medical evaluation, uh, bottom line is they can't wear a respirator. So the bottom line to that, um, and it's, you know, hopefully you don't have to deal with it, but we're talking about the safety of your employees. Uh, if they can't pass a medical evaluation, they can't wear a respirator. If they can't wear a respirator, they can't be within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure. So um, that's, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, not a, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. Um, there, that person might have to have to start doing some non-clinical functions until or, uh, uh, until this until this thing passes. But if it's not safe for them to wear a respirator, um, you as a practice owner, you are you're really rolling the dice to let that person uh, work within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure. Any procedure they've got to wear a rest, that they require to wear a respirator for, if you're if you're letting them either a um, be around that procedure without a respirator on, or b 
they're wearing a respirator, but they're not medically qualified to, um, you know, what I would probably do is I would take my dental license off of my wall and I would go put it in my safe deposit box because that's a, it's, um, uh, you're putting it at risk and, and you're putting your, you're putting your employee at risk. So that's a great question. Um, uh, we've also had, um, this is along the same line, uh, what if someone fails a fit test? Um, with N95s and KN95s, and, and I've got to back up for a minute because this is not my words. These are the words of our, of our, the president of our company, um, who has been dealing with fit testing in industrial, um, with industrial clients for over 20 years. And the way he put it to me the other day was, Lee, I've never seen someone fail a fit test unless they have facial hair or scars. So um, um, if, if you get, sometimes face size can affect it a little bit, but um, and the reason I brought this up is we had a client who was either in Oregon or Washington uh, about a month ago. Um, she sent her one of her staff members to an occupational health clinic to be fit tested, and she failed with five different respirators. Uh, a couple, three of them were different models of N95s, and two of them were different models of KN95s. Um, and we eventually told her that she needed to go to a, a different industrial uh, or a different uh, occupational health clinic uh, because something was just going on. Okay, so uh, got, a, got a question here uh, about where do you get a fit test? Great question. I was coming to it, but you beat me to it. Uh, so there are a couple of ways you can go about doing this. Um, you can do the fit tests yourself in your practice. Uh, and to do that, you've got to source a fit test kit. Um, most of your dental supply companies, um, and Josh, I don't know if y'all got them at TDA Perks Supplies, um, but a lot of people carry them. They're fit test kit. That's, they can run anywhere from 150 to I've seen them up to four or five hundred dollars right now. Uh, and you can normally perform 50 to 60 fit tests with that fit test kit before you have to get some resupplies of the uh, bitter or sweet uh, solutions that you use. Um, so for a practice with probably more than four or five employees, uh, it's definitely worth uh, looking into getting a fit test kit um, uh, because it can save you some money. Uh, the other way to go about getting one is to send your folks out to um, a uh, occupational health clinic like a concerta. Uh, they do them all the time. Uh, in your in your area, just I would Google occupational health clinic, and you'll probably, unless you're out in um, you know Oskaloosa, Iowa, you're probably going to have uh, ten or fifteen names of occupational health clinics come up right away. Most of them don't require an appointment. Um, and you can go right in. Um, they're going to charge you anywhere from, I've seen them as low as $90. I've seen them as high as $120 per person to do a fit test. Um, you, you definitely want to do your medical evaluations before they go in. And you definitely want to tell that whoever at the clinic you're working with, hey, we've already done our medical evaluations. Because if they do the medical evaluations, they're going to charge you another $20 or $30 per person to do those. So go ahead and get those out of the way. If you, if you choose to use an occupational health clinic for your fit test, get those medical evaluations out of the way before you go in for that. Um, okay. Now, there, there is a third way, and there is a pretty high um, PITA uh, uh, factor that goes with this, a pain in the you-know-what. You can actually create your own fit test kit. There are instructions 
uh, in the OSHA uh, respiratory protection um, regulations on how to do that. Now, it's not going to be free because you're still going to have to be able to purchase some nebulizers and you're also going to have to purchase the the uh, uh, solutions you use, which is either a sour or sweet um, to be able to, but it, it has instructions on how to create one and how to use it. Now, there are probably 200 YouTube videos um, on how to conduct a fit test. Um, 3M, which is probably the largest manufacturer of fit test kits in the country, actually has a really good um, uh, instructional video on how to do fit tests. Um, in our respiratory protection program, we've got, um, we've got videos on how to conduct fit tests and also uh, how to properly don and doff um, respirators. So there are a number of places where you can where you can find that information. Um, let's see. Okay, doggone it! I think we've got all the questions. Are there any more questions? I'm going to stand on my soapbox for just a second because I've got nine minutes. I'm not going to take nine minutes, but I'm going to stand up on my soapbox for just a second. If you don't have a respiratory protection program in place, let me tell you the quickest and easiest way to, to get one put in and also take care of all your other OSHA and HIPAA compliance. And that's with one of our programs. Um, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago that we've been dealing with respiratory protection programs for over 20 years in the, on the industrial side of our business. Well, most RPPs for industry uh, come in a notebook that's anywhere from six to eight inches thick. And that's just gross overkill. That's, that's, um, that's, yeah, it's just overkill for dental practices. Um, so what we did back in March is we actually took an industrial strength um, RPP and we boiled it down to the bare essence to what was only required for dental practices. And that's the, we created basically the first RPP for the dental industry in the United States. It's very simple to administer. Um, it's very simple to put into place so that you are perfectly legal and you're helping keep your employees safe. And that's, that's part of our program now. So, um, um, you know, if, if you want more information on that, um, reach out to, you can reach out to me directly after the, um, after the webinar. Uh, and I can answer your questions, or I can put you I can put you in touch with one of our senior compliance advisors here in Texas, Texas, that um, probably know more about this business than I do. So, if there are no more questions, um, I think we'll wrap it up, Josh. Uh, doggone it, we're finishing actually seven minutes ahead of time today. Wow, look at that, uh, <laughs> Lee. Thank you so much, as always, for you know taking taking the time and to provide this information to members and. You know, we really appreciate it. Like I said, Lee does several webinars with us. Uh, several of them can be found in the resource section of the Perks website. Uh, this is being recorded and we will send it out via email in case you missed any of it or have a colleague uh, that, that needs to get this information as well. Um, just, just letting everyone know that. Um, Lee, I, th I think that's it. Again, thank you so much. You can get in touch with me uh, at the TDA. It's jepstein at tda.org or reach me by phone, 512-443-3675, extension 161. And I can always help get um, get you in touch with anyone from Smart Training, especially Lee, Mr. Slate in there. Uh, hey, 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 Josh, Josh, yes, I, I just noticed a couple of other questions. So if, if, oh, okay. if you want to listen, for, let's, go ahead, let's yeah, go ahead and hit these because a couple of these are really good and I missed them. Um, okay. So the first one is, how do we know if an N95 is approved when there's so much product confusion? For example, some say N95 respirator and level three mask for the same product. If, if you're looking at a product and it's talking about an N95 respirator and a level three mask in the same sentence, I would run. Uh, basically what you're looking for on an N95 is that it said it is NIOSH approved. If it says NIOSH approved on it, um, you can pretty much take that to the bank because there's some serious jail time involved if someone purports, if, if they put a product out as being 
NIOSH approved and it's not. So in an N95, now where we've seen the big problems with counterfeiting is on KN95s, the, the, the ones coming in from, um, from overseas. Uh, and the way you do on those um, is they're gonna have a number and you can actually look it up on the CDC website all the different approved vendors overseas who have, they don't have NIOSH approval, but they have approval through the country's regulatory authority that they're coming out of, okay? Um, so that's the best way to tell, and, and you can actually look, you can either go to the product's website or you can go to the CDC website and they will tell you, like for, for a particular product, most of them, they'll actually show a picture of what the packaging looks like and then what the actual respirator looks like. So that's how you can tell. Um, okay, so I hope I answered that. And Sandra, if I didn't, you're more, more than welcome to give me a call when we get through. Um, let's see. So if we switch N95 brands, do we have to redo fit testing? Okay. Um, I'm going to go off the record here, if there's such a thing on a webinar. <laughs> uh, here's what I'm going to say. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, if you switch to a different brand or a different style, um, then yes, you're supposed to redo fit testing. Now, we're, we're in some extraordinary times right now. And here's what I would tell you from a practical standpoint. And again, this, this is off the record, but this is based on what I'm seeing out there. Um, I would go, I would go to the mat and fight for a client if OSHA came in and cited them and they had everything else in order. In other words, if OSHA came in, if I was a practice owner and I had all of my written safety programs in place, all my trainings done. I've got my RPP in place. I've got that written program. I've got the medical evaluations done. I have done everything. I've dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's. And oh my gosh, we ran out of N95s. We had to switch. And oh my gosh, we hadn't fit tested it yet. If an OSHA inspector came in and they saw what a great job you were doing overall, and you even had an RPP in place, with all your I's dotted and T's crossed, and you have recently had to change um, suppliers on N95s, I would go to the mat on that. I would go to the mat. So, um, so the short answer is yes, you're, you're required to do that, but, uh, oh boy. Um, hmm. I would, uh, I would, I would call that supplier back and see if you can get some more from the original supplier. Um, you know, I, I know what the rules say and uh, I'm, I'm a rule follower, but uh, in this instance, I'd, I'd probably just follow more sword and say, hey, look, if you're gonna get me for this, get me, but I've done everything y'all have asked me to do and then some, and um, uh, we just couldn't find any more. They, you know, we've been told they're, we're gonna get the same ones back in but they're back ordered and we're expecting our suppliers expecting this original brand back in in a week or two. We're just doing this to get by for the next week or so until we can get more of the original one. That, that would be my story and I'd stick to it. All right, Josh, let's see. Um, uh, did we get to them, Molly? Yes, yes we did. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks again, Lee, and and thanks everyone yeah. for being for being on our our webinar today. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, have a great weekend. Please stay safe and take care. Thanks, Lee. Okay. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Be safe.